the next segment of our discussion is really to focus on uh, therapy and how we approach patients. And I, get, I am predicting, we haven't kind of uh, talked about it, but I'm predicting that with five people who treat mental cell patients, you'll get five different styles. Um, but I think there are probably some commonalities and then some differences that it's important for the audience to know about. So first um, is the issue of watch and wait. And so uh, I think everybody is appreciated now that we can watch and wait as we do in other indolent lymphomas uh, in mantle cell lymphoma, a subset of patients. And the question, and we'll start with uh, you, Steve, um, you know, who do you watch and wait with? Do you monitor everybody for a while or if they're asymptomatic? Or how do you decide um, whether or not to embark for an individual patient, at least for a period of time of watch and wait? Yeah, I think the, um, the only thing more heterogeneous than the biology of this disease uh, is the opinions that you get when you ask uh, people how they manage their patients. So if we all have different answers to these questions, it means that uh, we're all right, okay? Um, in, in any event, uh, I'll start by saying, whenever I'm not sure what to do, I don't do anything. I watch the disease and I let the disease tell me what to do depending on the tempo and pro pro progression, et, et cetera. Um, and so that's sort of my underlying philosophy with any lymphoproliferative diseases and certainly mantle cell lymphoma, which in the absence of any uh, negative molecular uh, features um, is, ca can be unpredictable. Uh, anyway, watch and wait, I think there's clearly a role in those that present, uh, as Andre said, with a CLL-like clinical picture, splenomegaly, uh, um, lymphocytosis with CD5 positive B cells, although the immunoglobulin tends to be brighter on them than CLL, and uh, those patients tend to be uh, SOX11 negative and, and, uh, um, and, and and soma have somatic right. hypermutation. So, it, I mean, that's a no-brainer. You watch them the way you do a CLL patient. And in fact, unless they take on some additional cytogenetic events, you can even manage them like a CLL patient, you know? So, uh, um, so yeah, so that's, a, that's an easy one. What about the patient that presents with colon polyps and a little bit of low volume nodal disease? Right. Um, you know, a low key 67 score, you know, um, no P53 mutations, but obviously the cyclin D1 um, rearrangement. Uh, I'll actually watch those patients, you know, and, um, and, and look at the tempo of the disease. I don't find, most of the therapies in mantle cell lymphoma are, um, if you look at the KM curves, are in the end palliative. So when, you know, and I don't know that a delay in treatment of months has negatively impacted on anyone. Obviously, if somebody presents with very aggressive features, then you want to intervene before a patient gets sick. But I think there's no harm to watching. What's the longest you've ever watched a, a nodal mantle cell patient? So, um, okay, yeah. so, this is a good, I'm glad you asked yeah. that because this, I learned my lesson from watching pa this patient. Yeah. So I had a patient who was a physician um, who in the early 90s, before the description of mantle cell lymphoma, was diagnosed with a uh, a small uh, to intermediate sized B cell lymphoma had been treated with CHOP back then. There was, this is in the pre rituximab era, and became my patient in the mid 90s when he recurred. And we biopsied him, uh, some mediastinal nodes, and it showed you know, a horrific blastoid mantle cell lymphoma. And he was relatively asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So, um, despite the in those days, we weren't doing the molecular testing, but despite the ugly morphology, I followed him for 11 years before wow. he required treatment. Wow. So, Alexei, do you just briefly, because I... I'm sorry, that's, oh, probably, that's probably just the, the exception, I think, that for, for, no, our, sure. for our audience. I think, John, you, ha you actually were one of the first observers, your team, that um, and the, this group of patients that have, beside the CLL-like picture, the, the low bulk can be monitored, I agree. And the median time to treatment is typically one year. I mean, there are some mm -hmm. patients that can be, so far, well, audience practically, yeah. yes, and that, that gives us a bit of a, a yeah. framework. Yeah. Just quickly, uh, uh, Alexei, you thought on KI-67, do you use that when you see a patient who you're considering watch and wait? Will you, if the KI-67 is 10, will you watch and wait? And if it's 40 or 50, will you not, even if it's clinically the same? Or do you just kind of uh, go b based on the clinical guidance? So, yeah, in my practice, I've been growing up as a CLL doc originally, <laughs> and in my practice, most of the indolent mental cell lymphomas I have, I have seen uh, have peripheral blood lymphocytosis, which, by the way, somewhat derails the MIPI score because uh, leukocytosis is part of the MIPI score. Uh, in those patients, I do not test for KI-67, and uh, I do rather minimal workup. Um, in, uh, in terms of uh, KI-67 on the lymph node biopsy, 
Um, I would say that overall it would still for me have rather um, limited, uh, um, uh, limited value in terms of uh, treatment decision. Um, you know, data from Emory and from Wild Cornell does suggest that you can watch those patients up, up to a year and uh, it's somewhat controversial what KI-67 might contribute there. It sort, of, it sort of tells me how close to watch them. I don't right. think there's a single laboratory test by itself that would make me treat somebody like immediately. 